Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Matters of Faith, the radio show. Matters of Faith is a show Good evening, everybody, to issues and of welcome to, to you, the listening faith, audience the radio show. that will challenge, of faith encourage, is a show. motivate, and inspire you to keep the faith. I am your host, the Reverend Dr. J. Lauren Russell, and it's my job to engage you in stimulating dialogue, dialogue that's inspiring, encouraging, motivating, dialogue and conversations that will help you build your determination, your commitment, and your character, conversations that will help you keep the faith. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. 1 John 5 and 4. And now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, without further ado, it is time for Matters of Faith, the radio show. Good evening, everybody. Today is Monday, September 25th. It's 8 o'clock, and it's time for Matters of Faith, the radio show. I am your host, the Reverend Dr. J. Lauren Russell. I'm also your producer. And tonight we're talking about the article and the topic, Intoxicated in the Spirit. We're broadcasting live on Matters of Faith and the J. Lauren Russell Facebook groups. Tell a phone and tell a friend they do not want to miss this episode tonight because our very special guest is Reverend Dr. James B. Logan, the pastor of the historic Messiah Baptist Church in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Don't miss this show tonight. Reverend Dr. James B. Logan is with us. You're with us. Tonight we're showing up. We're showing out. Telephone and tell a friend. Matters of Faith is on again. Don't forget to support our advertisers and our sponsors, the JLR Company and J. Lauren Russell Consulting, LLC, for all of your church financial consulting needs. Check out our website, www.jlorenrussellconsulting.com. That's www.jlorenrussellconsulting.com or simply give us a call, 718-328-8096, 718-328-8096. If you want to train your trustees, if you want to develop your property, if you need a church loan, give us a call. We'll be there to help. Matters of Faith, the book, can be purchased at my cash app, dollar sign Matters of Faith. The cost of the book is $22.80. That's $22.80. You can send your check of money order to the JLR company, Post Office Box 301, New York, New York, 10035. That's Post Office Box 301, New York, New York, 10035. Get the book. It will absolutely bless your life. You can also get it as an ebook. All you need to do is go to www.smashwords.com backslash books backslash view backslash 993177. That's www.smashwords.com backslash books backslash view backslash 993177. The book has no shipping and handling if you get it as an ebook. And also check out the Eat Okra app for all black owned restaurants all over the nation. That's right, Eat Okra. And finally, subscribe, like, and share our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. Make sure that you subscribe, like, and share our Matters of Faith. YouTube channel. Let me add just one more thing. Get your subscription to Better Mag Magazine today. A two year subscription is only $27.50. That's www.abettermag.com. www.abettermag.com. And now the article Intoxicated in the Spirit. That article can be found in my column, Matters of Faith at the Bronx Chronicle, www.thebronxchronicle. It can also be found in the Yonkers Insider, www.yonkersinsider.blogspot.com. It's also in Better Mag Magazine, www.abettermag.com, as well as Black Westchester Magazine and Pamela's Big Heart Newsletter, Intoxicated in the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 21, the Amplified Bible. Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living life with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil, not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence, 
because the days are filled with evil. Therefore, do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness, corruption, stupidity. But be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by Him. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, offering praise by singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for all things, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Intoxicated in the Spirit I remember when I was a young man, actually, I was a teenager, drinking with friends. I don't remember how much they drank, but I would routinely drink until I was thoroughly inebriated. What started as a buzz became a drunken stupor. It was the cool thing to do, so we would drink regularly, sometimes resulting in us cussing and fighting each other. It always fascinates me when I think back to my days of drinking and consuming other mind-altering substances, how committed I was to spending time and money to acquire the substances, taking the time to consume them, the time it took to be under their influence, and of course, the recovery time. I must admit, many of those episodes I cannot recall, even though each one consumed somewhere around 8 to 12 hours, and who knows how much money, all in pursuit of a good time. I finally came to my senses and recognized that I was wasting my most precious gifts on something that was literally robbing and killing me at the same time. The Apostle Paul understood that there were many people whose interests were in drunkenness. He admonishes his readers to be wise and seek the understanding and to understand the will of God for their lives. He quickly tells them not to be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. The capitalization of the word Spirit indicates the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What follows in his discourse is the results of being filled with the Spirit as opposed to being drunk with wine. Drunken stupors versus speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, being helpful to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul was right. Being intoxicated with wine leads to hangovers, early morning dry mouth, lots of wasted time, wasted resources, misused talents, and squandered money. But when you are intoxicated with the Spirit of God, you sing songs of praise to God from the heart. You give thanks to God the Father for all things. And in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you love others the way the Lord loves you. If you're going to be intoxicated, get drunk in the Word of God. The experience is amazing and the rewards are eternal. Be blessed. Here's my question tonight. In what ways are the so-called saints of God who are not intoxicated in the spirit creating more damage in the church than those who are drunk from the wine of the world? Let me ask it again because I want you to hear me clearly. In what ways are the so-called saints of God who are not intoxicated in the spirit creating more damage in the church than those who are drunk from the wine of the world. And now it gives me a great deal of pleasure and my honor to introduce to some and present to others my very special guest this evening. Reverend Dr. James B. Logan is a native New Yorker. His parents are deacons James and Mamie Logan of Convent Avenue Baptist Church in New York City. Dr. Logan's academic accomplishments consist of a Bachelor's of Science degree in Business Administration from York College of the City, University of New York, a Master of Divinity degree from New York Theological Seminary and Doctor of Ministry degree in Christian Education from Dallas Theological Seminary with a concentration in marriage and family ministry. His dissertation was entitled, A Comparative Church Study of Successful Family Ministry Models. In addition, Dr. Logan received several human resource management certifications from Cornell School of Industrial Labor Relations in New York City. Upon completion of his undergraduate studies, James worked for over 20 years in both the public and private sectors. His professional and career experience included a breadth of responsibilities in human resource management, training and development, clinical services administration, career coaching, and benefits management. 
These assignments span industries such as healthcare, pharmaceutical, outplacement services, and sports management. He was also served, or he also served as an adjunct professor at the College of New Rochelle Manhattan campus teaching classes in theology and the black church. Dr. Logan was called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ during his progressive years of progressive growth in the public and private sectors. However, God used him to be a light in the marketplace and to develop skills that would eventually be needed for the work of ministry planned for his life. He was licensed and ordained to the gospel ministry at the Convent Avenue Baptist Church under the leadership of the late Reverend Dr. Clarence P. Grant. Dr. Logan served five years as the first full-time executive pastor at Convent under the current senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Jesse T. Williams, Jr. Prior to this full-time position, he was bivocational while providing pastoral care at Florence Nightingale Nursing Home in New York City and the children and youth pastor for 12 years. On June 16, 2013, Dr. Logan was humbled to be called as the sixth senior pastor of the historic 133-year-old Messiah Baptist Church in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and installed on March 16, 2014. Pastor Logan serves at Messiah with joy and great expectation of God doing a marvelous work through the ministry while impacting the community and the entire state of Connecticut. He has a passion for equipping people to live transformed lives through Christ and reaching their full potential and a burden to bring restoration and healing to families and to broken relationships. Dr. Logan is happily married to Virginia Caroline his beautiful wife of 35 years. Lady Logan continues to serve faithfully with him in ministry and undergirds him in prayer. They are the proud parents of two lovely daughters, Olivia Savannah and Sydney Alexandria. Pastor and Lady Logan partner together as they serve in their leadership roles at Messiah Baptist Church of Bridgeport, Connecticut and believe that through Christ, the best is yet to come. My Matters of Faith family, would you welcome with me tonight my very special guest, this brother that was born on my birthday, great man of God, Reverend Dr. James B. Logan. Well, did I get it right? Did I get you in there right? Uh, yes, yes, you got it correct. I, I love you this it. Evening. I love it. I love it. How are you, my brother? And welcome to Matters of Faith. This has been a long time coming, but you're here tonight, man. <laughs> yes, you got me. You, you sure do. I, I owe this. I owe you this, man. You've been so committed and dedicated, and I appreciate you uh, just being, just inviting me. Just oh, have man, an opportunity you know, you're to welcome, you. brother. I, I've been, I've been waiting for. I've been looking forward to this. We, we go back a ways. We've been doing things together for a while. But um, yeah. I have not been able to work it out so that we would be together. So now we are. Thank you for coming. I'm, 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 I'm just humbled that you're here tonight. And I know you're going to be a blessing. So let me ask you the same question I ask every one of my guests before I ask them anything else. I read some of your bio. I didn't read it all. I read uh -huh. some out so that you can include it yourself. But tell us something about you that we don't know and we really should know. Hmm. Wow. Um, you, you know... Uh, one of the things, <clears throat> one of the things I think of, of people may not know is that um, uh, my background. I was uh, born in New York City, of course, right in, uh, in in Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, and so I was on the east side of Harlem. Uh, but I was uh, sent to Orangeburg, South Carolina, to uh, stay with my grandparents while my parents were getting things established. Uh, up up in New York, and so that was something that many parents did back then quite a bit uh, to send relatives, you know, uh, to South Carolina or to the to the South. And so while I was there, uh, from the age of just a few months old until I was almost four, at the age of three, while I was there with my uh, big mom and big daddy that I called them, mm -hmm. um, I, I drank kerosene. Mm. Uh, I, I don't think people too many, too many people uh, you know thought about that or even knew that. But uh, I drank kerosene, and really the the essence of the story is that because if you know if you drank kerosene today, I shouldn't be here today. Absolutely. Uh, 
but I was a little kid. And back then you would have, um, they parents, grandparents would keep all sorts of liquids in these soda bottles, you know, like the Pepsi glass bottles. Mm. And my big mama had it on the top above the stove. And what I did was I was thirsty one day, it was hot outside, me being so curious. Uh, and I got up on the stove and got this, uh, got this bottle right off the shelf thinking it was really Pepsi. And lo and behold, it was something else. And when I came outside in the front yard to my grandmother or my big mama, I was looking strange there and she asked me what was wrong and I told her what I did. I guess my throat must've been burning quite a bit. <laughs> so they got me to the hospital and make a long story short, um, while I was in the hospital and I recall all this, like it was, mm -hmm. and here it is, I'm way over three years old today, yeah, yeah. but it was such a traumatic experience for me. My parents came from New York uh, and of course I had my grandparents, my parents, I had some other relatives around the hospital bed, my hospital bed, praying for me at that young age. And of course, I'm still here only by the grace of God. And I share that story because to me, uh, over the years, as I reflect back over that, Dr. Russell, I realized that God had a plan for my life. And I believe that God used that to always help me to realize that I'm not here just to be here. It's not a coincidence that there is there's a plan over my life and obviously god has been doing that over the years and i often reflect back on it and sometimes we need to do that to look back and see you know what god has done to help us to move forward and so i often uh use that or reflect upon that as a life-changing moment for me even though i wasn't even four years old yet mm. at that time so so that's wow. something that's important to me I, you know i thought i, I thought you're gonna say that that your grandparents gave you a little spoon of kerosene to, to keep you healthy, you know, because in, the, in those days, they would do stuff like that. They would give you a spoonful of this and a spoonful of that, and it That's would right. ward off all kinds of diseases and things like that. But you actually took the bottom and put it to your head. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, I don't know. I could slap myself now. I don't know what in the world I was thinking. I think about that now, and I said, what were you doing? But you're and you're absolutely right, though, that there were there were a lot of little concoctions and, mm -hmm. you know, these home remedies that they did in the South. My my parents um, who, are, who are still alive and they, you know, they've been telling us stories for years how I think parents used to give them was uh, turpentine, mm -hmm. just a little bit of that, put it on a spoon mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. and they swallow it and all. Of, you know, I'm like, what? You just, yeah, just a little bit. This will cut yeah, this, and, you know, you have a cold and it'll clear your throat up. I said, yeah, I guess right. it should, you know, but uh, yeah, there are a lot of things that they did. And I think maybe that's part of the reason why my grandparents had, but also because uh, they used it to have uh, light. Mm, you know, they yep, had the kerosene right, lamps right, exactly, at that time. Exactly. So even though they had electricity, but they, as a safety valve, they would always use that, you know, uh, right. down there. So, yeah, but that, that would listen, that's, that's one of the things that I thought of when you raised that question. And it's always a, a life changing moment. It was life changing moment for me. And I always reference that just to keep me focused. You, you know, what's interesting about that story is that um, uh, outside of the, the, you know, that you chugged it in, instead of getting a spoonful, you know, like the turpentine and stuff like that, because my mom's from South Carolina. Oh. Dad's from North Carolina, but his father is from Dorchester County, South Carolina. Wow. So, so I got that. I know that, um, you know, my mom used to eat some of that red dirt, you'll feel better. You know, they eat that red clay dirt. I mean, all kinds of stuff. They would put the red clay dirt on saws. Like if you fell and you scraped yourself up, they put that little red clay dirt on there and see, right. it, it healed you. I, don't ask me what the medicinal uh, uh, <laughs> remedy is in it, but somehow or another that, that stuff worked. But uh -huh. it was interesting because I, as I think in my own life, I think about life-changing things that happened to me at a young age like that as well. Um, I didn't drink turpentine or kerosene, <laughs> uh -huh. but I fell off a truck. Mm. an ice truck wow. you know I used to, they used to deliver ice right because we had ice i'm old enough to remember ice boxes right where where they would they would deliver boxes or ice 
and you would put it in the refrigerator and that's what would keep it cold. They call them ice boxes. That's where we get the name from. I remember that. I re I'm old wow. enough to remember that. Well, yeah. there was a truck that was delivering. It was parked downstairs and I was no more. I couldn't have been more than three years old, just like you. Uh -huh. And I climbed up on the truck and right. fell, hit my head, oh my went upstairs and went to sleep. Mm. Didn't wake up for about three or four days. Wow. Had a concussion, was knocked unconscious. And I'm thinking my, my parents must have been out of their minds. This three-year-old boy, and I remember, um, like you remembered vividly, people standing over your bed praying. I don't remember them standing over my bed praying, but what I do remember is it was in Mar Senior Hospital. I was born in Harlem Hospital and grew up in the Bronx. So mm -hmm. Mar Senior Hospital was in the Bronx, what, by 167th Street, 167th. And I remember my father holding me up to the window so I could look down and see my two brothers downstairs waving at me. Wow. So wow. I, I have one of those memories too. And I think that, you know, as you said, God had a purpose for your life. Yep. And I think that I always say that the Lord was talking to me while I was asleep, while I was unconscious. He was having a private conversation with me, telling me what he had planned for me in life. Hmm. That's so right. it's interesting. And of course, you know, because, you know, you, you got this great birthday. I can't figure that that has something to do with it. You know? <laughs> You're a good man. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so, yeah, but, I, but I'm, I'm really glad that you're here tonight. I really am. Uh, I was looking forward to this because, you know, I remember when we first got acquainted, you were there at Compton Avenue Baptist Church and I was there at Goodwill and Grady Universal and uh, your prior, you know, your your previous minister of, of youth was there. And I think you had me come in and, and, and preach at the yes. church there at Convent Avenue Baptist Church the first time. Yeah. And yes. we began to talk. And I think I was working then at a foster care agency. Right. And you were working for Major League Baseball. Wow. <laughs> and you made a recommendation. You you referred me to someone because I was looking for someone to come and address the kids. And you were able to help me to do that. Wow. Forget it, because it was it was major because the kids in foster care, you know, they they always feel like they're the most neglected of all. Nobody cares. Their parents fail them, and then the system lets them down. And they're and they're literally um um, you know, they, they are the the, the least of these. Mm -hmm. And then the statistics prove it out because I think the number, the last time I checked, was something like 67% of all incarcerated individuals were in foster care. Mm -hmm. So what you did in your referral had a major impact. Wow. I forgot yeah. about that. I surely did. That's right. I, I, I work with... Um, at the Office of Commissioner of Major League Baseball for about, I want to say about three or four years. And I met some very, very influential people, uh, great experience, and part of my journey again in working in the marketplace, uh, which also prepares you for ministry. Uh, and uh, it was good. It, you know, I'm glad that that, that worked out well, uh, because there are some people that are really genuine and sincere and and MLB, they loved community. They loved helping uh, others. And, you know, uh, I believe there's there was also, there's an, let me see if I'm correct. Uh, I'm trying to see, there was, well, I don't know all the names, but there were several pockets of or divisions within MLB that uh, had some kind of outreach component mm -hmm. that you normally don't hear of it on outside, right. you know, right. in public. Right. But, they do a lot behind the scenes. And then some individuals who are just wonderful people, good-hearted mm -hmm. people, and they wanted to help out. So I'm glad that, that that worked well, man. Yeah, yeah, it did. It really did. I, you know, I, I don't forget when people do things, you know, and sometimes, you know, my, my, one, of my, one of the things I tell people all the time is to do something good for someone. And if they find out that it's you, it doesn't count. You got to do it again. Ah, uh, wow. So I like it's that. It's just a challenge to continue to do good things because, you know, the more good you do, the more difference you make. That's right. That's and, right. And, and you should you should be practicing. It should become a, a, a not not a practice, but a but a way of life. Absolutely, I like that. I have to use that now. Yeah, why not? 
you know, yeah. listen, I'm saying it publicly. Anybody can use it. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I really believe that, you know, I'm, I'm strong. I'm, I strongly believe that because, you know, uh, as you read in the article that I wrote, everybody has a history. Mm -hmm. right? Every saint has a past. Yes. But every sinner has a future. Hmm. And so if we if we share what we have, if we're not if we're not embarrassed nor ashamed of where we come from, uh, I, I'm 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 proud to say I was born in Harlem Hospital. I mean, it make I mean I'm just proud because you know not everybody can say that. Not everybody right. can say that they were born in Harlem and and raised in the South Bronx and 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 when the South when the Bronx was burning and all that kind. I can say that. Um, yeah. You know, hip hop. I I can say I was a part of that whole genre. I'm proud of that. I'm yeah. proud that I got through those very challenging times when, when alcohol and drugs were commonplace and, and everybody was doing it. And, 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 I, and I was not, I was not um, you know, I, I was not sheltered from that. I was involved in that. And, 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 I made, and, and the Lord got me through it. Because of that yeah. conversation he had me when I was three years old laying on that bed after I yeah. fell on my head. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, kept reminding yeah. me. Hey, you remember what I told you, right? Remember what I That's told right. you? That's no, right. That's right. Lord, I don't remember it. Yeah, but I told it to you. You'll remember it. It's it's here. It's here. It's, it's here. Matter of fact, it's in your heart. Don't worry That's about right. it. I got you. <laughs> right, right, right. So, uh -huh. you know, so so yeah. Tonight, you know, we're talking about this article, intoxicated in the spirit. And I got to tell you that you know when I uh, I've been doing this now for about nine years writing and then doing this 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 broadcast and um i never know what i'm going to write about this is like a sermon right you never know until the lord yeah. tells you right so I, he always tells us okay lord this is what the and, and then all of a sudden it'll pour out and this is what he wants me to do and mm -hmm. and, and this in this article a part of it for me was being transparent letting people kind of get a, a, a view because i think sometimes people see the end results of work that has been taking years, you know, like an overnight success only yeah. takes about 20 years. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but right. they don't know That's what right. happened 20 years ago. They don't know all don't the stuff know. that you went through. And so, exactly. so part of it with being transparent to let people know that, hey, you're not the only one, that there are others that are just like you, that have passed, that, that, that swallowed the kerosene and kept living. That's right. You know? That's so, right. so I'm going to ask you, what did you think when you read the article, we're talking about a lot of other things too. Um, we're talking about your daughter and your your wife and all of the things that you've been doing in your life and, and where you are now. I want to hear all of that. But what were your first thoughts when you read this article? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one, one of the uh, first thoughts I had was, uh, I well, you used the word actually, which was in my heart, was the transparency uh, of sharing what you have experienced in life and um, I, I thought of even just looking at the text and the impact that drunkenness uh, had, even in several verses that we would read, you know, we, you know, the Old Testament, some was drunk, was Noah's drunk. You know, I started thinking about that. I started thinking about then the, the, the book of Acts where the church was formed and okay, so you have the Holy Spirit comes and some people think that they were drunk. I, I yeah, all those thoughts came to mind at that time. Uh, but I, I, I value quite a bit the level and depth of transparency, and it gave a, a snapshot of of what you experienced, and also how God brings transformation, how there's change that's that's made in one's life. Uh, I saw grace. Uh, you know, grace extended. Uh, all of those thoughts came to mind when I read the article. I, I'm glad you said that because, you know, again, I I, I just write. I don't, I, I've, I've gotten to the point in my life that um, I'm not ashamed of anything I've done. <laughs> not yeah. Yeah. Because right. if, if I hadn't gone through that, I couldn't be who I am today. Exactly. And I kind of yeah. like the guy that I look, you know, that looking that I'm looking at on the screen to look back at me in the mirror. I kind of I've grown to like this guy, not just yeah. love him. I like him. I think he's um, you know, I think he's a pretty good guy. 
And so to share his life experiences for me has been just, you know, an amazing thing because it has not made me less. It has made me more. Right. Right. Yeah. I, you know, um, I, I, I really like it too, because it gives hope, mm. you know, uh, and it also is a reflection of what we see in our communities and even in our families, if we all are honest, uh, we all have seen this. We all know it exists and we see the impact of it. We see uh, whether it's the driving, the drunk driving accidents and deaths that have occurred, uh, all of that comes to mind too, you know, just looking at the practicality of, of, of this text and, and of the article where you described it. Uh, for you, and um, that that stood out to me quite a bit. I I I also would would say that it made me sit down and think about what would life be for people who experience the transformation, but they're bound in it and they cannot get out uh, of, of this drunkenness. So, um, how many, you know? having a background work with young people as well in the church, uh, you know, I wonder how many young people even today are in situations where they're not able to get out of that. And, and mm -hmm. you know, it's not just drunkenness, but other things that they're bound in and they really never really see that kind of level of change in their lives. And, and, and I know there are some people, I remember I was talking to some young person one time and they were telling me how, that's what they did. I mean, it, it was nothing unusual for them to, to just get drunk mm -hmm. or, or they're drinking so much until, you know how to say a functioning alcoholic almost yeah. where, you yeah. know, you, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're operating like everything is fine, but at the same time, there's a lot going on inside the body. Uh, and, you know, you just, I, I, so all of those, those thoughts came to mind as I was reading that article. I mean, there are more things I thought about, but just to share that that really, it triggered a lot in just looking at it, even for my family, um, I was reflecting, uh, one of my grandfathers, uh, well, first of all, you, you know, my family, you know, we, God bless me to come from a wonderful family, mm. um, you know, but we all have issues. Like I think every everyone does. And I have my issues. Everyone has some kind of issue, something that we are learning, we're growing from. And uh, one of my grandfathers, uh, who's wonderful, uh, beautiful person, uh, but one of the things that happened to him was that he, of course, you know, he drank alcohol and, you know, nothing, okay, that's nothing, you know, people take wine, I get that. Mm -hmm. But in his situation, uh, the, the tragedy is that he got accustomed to drinking so much until he could function, and it led him to a different environment at times. And he got around some folks at a party. And this is a grown man, a man as I think he was in his 70s at that time. And I don't know the whole story. We still don't know the whole story uh, is, uh, clearly today. But at this party, he was drinking. Uh, someone misunderstood his, uh, maybe his, his actions in talking to someone. And he had a glass in his hand, you know, drinking, mm -hmm. put the glass down. Someone must have put something in it. And all of a sudden, he stumbled out of the building, collapsed, and never regained consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so when we got, my father and I got to the hospital, Harlem Hospital to be exact, uh, we got there. Um, you know, one of the nurses said, what happened to this man? Hmm. When I said, we don't know. We just got him. We just got the call that he, 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 he was, he was, he was unconscious. He was at a party and, you know, and so I, I, I would say to you that at that young age for me to witness or hear that I was uh, a teenager, but that took any kind of taste. If I had it, I never had a taste for hmm. it. But mm. it just it just took every, any kind of taste from me. I don't I didn't want anything to deal with any kind of alcohol. But I, I say that to say that it was the environment. And you know you start thinking about what where does uh, 
alcohol to that state lead you and what circles mm -hmm. and you know someone might be doing it casual and everything but at the same time what circles what rooms do you find yourself in what kind of people are you around and when you get to that stage that he was at that time and uh so i i just say that that was something that really it turned me off which i guess god allowed me to feel that way as a teenager to help me to to be a buffer uh, in the midst of everything that I was going to experience later on as I continue to grow in life with other people. You know, I, I so appreciate that because you're right. I remember, I remember so distinctly um, when I was coming up, heroin became hmm. the, the drug of choice back then. And I mean, like everybody in the neighborhood, all of the guys, all of them, guys and girls alike, everybody was shooting dope, sniffing dope. It was two dollars a bag. Call them deuce bags. I never forget that. Uh, and and that was when Frank Lucas, you know, everybody saw the American gangster. Yeah. Frank Lucas and Nicky Barnes, and I mean, they 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 proliferated the community with drugs. I mean, everybody. I mean, you know, I remember how nice the neighborhood was when we moved into it. I mean, we left our door open. People come and go. It was nice. People spoke to each other they looked out for each other the whole but drugs came into the community mm -hmm. could no longer keep the door open there was women getting their pocketbook snatched yeah that was that was the the preferential way to get quick money to, to, to buy drugs <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, they would steal stealing breaking the people's homes stealing their stuff mm -hmm. This was the, this became the norm. And like, <clears throat> it felt like a dark cloud descended on the whole community. Yes. Had never seen anything like that before. And <clears throat> of course, while it was taking place, you know, you really didn't see it because you're in the forest. So you can't see the trees. But when you look back, I, mean, I, was, I look back, it was like this really, really dark cloud just descended and took over the community. And, and it was interesting because it was the people that changed. When you say the environment, it got into the heart of the people. Yeah. People no longer respected the elders. They no longer respected the mothers. They no longer respected people. So the heart became contaminated. And then the places that we would go, you know, if you're going to do dope, drugs, you go into some drug dens. You go where people are shooting dope. And, and, and the environment is crazy. It's not like you're going to vacation Bible school. <laughs> not at all. You're going to a place where debauchery is the norm. And I mean, it was, it got real crazy. And, and so, of course, any way you went, there was heroin marijuana cocaine cigarettes i mean you name it it was going on and and the environment the uh, and they talk about a cloud that was descending you go into these places into these spaces and the cigarette smoke put clouds in. i mean everybody and 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 it was that was fashionable because they advertise on tv everybody smoked so the whole room would be permeated with cigarette smoke and then half the people were drinking the other half doing dope, the other half smoking marijuana. And it was amazing because all of that in one little space. And as I said in my article, sometimes it led to us cussing each other out and fighting. Yep. Fighting. Hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. I could tell stories about that <laughs> in my own family, in my own yeah. family. Yeah. Alcohol and fighting go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more. It was a, um, <clears throat> and this young lady, I do know her, still see her today. Right in front of the building down there, two women, they would get together every day. They would drink every day, right in front of the building. And one day they got into an argument. These were good friends, drunk on alcohol. One pulled out a knife and stabbed the other. Mm. She bled out right there. Wow. She bled out right on the street, right wow. in front of the building. 
Um, but that was, that was like, I was like the norm. And I'm saying, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't pull away from it, you know, like you did, right? I saw it, but I didn't pull away from it. I still drank. I still indulged in those kinds of things. Um, it was the norm. You couldn't go anywhere. The people that I, everybody that I hung out with drank. Right. Everybody. So, right. you know, there were very few people um, that, that didn't drink and didn't get high. Mm -hmm. Very, very few. And and so those were not the ones I hung out with either. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you probably, you probably wouldn't have been uh, accepted. It's a very, it, it makes you, there's a lot of pressure in that to, yep. to you stand yep. out for not wanting to have a, a cup or something, or, yep. you know. Yep. You know, so that was a lot of pressure. It's yep. a lot of pressure today, uh, but back then it was a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. The only person I know who didn't do that was my brother. Wow. My brother did not like drinking. He didn't. And, and when he drank, he went crazy. He just went crazy. So, yeah, so yeah. he was like, I don't want no more. I don't want, he was, and he, I don't want no more. I don't want no more. And he was, yeah. he would take it and nobody would mess with him. Nobody would no. mess with him. But uh -huh. then, you know, for me, I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll take his. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you know i'm saying that i say those things not because i'm trying to shine light on it but i'm i'm trying to put light where it belongs to see that you know you can go through some things and get out but there are a lot of people who never got out and you talked That's about right. that right you said when they're bound yeah a lot of my friends i grew up with never made it right never made it um sunny Sonny got killed hmm. accidentally, accidentally. Mm -hmm. um, I was not there. I was, I was in the South, safe haven, right? Yeah. And it was in the summer and they were, they were out hanging out. Two guys got into a fight, drinking, got into a fight. And, and, and I think Sonny used to like sniffing glue. You remember that? People just yeah, sniff. Yeah. So something happened and two guys got into a fight and one guy took a bottle and broke it and did like this. And Sonny was standing behind him and it slit his throat. Oh my goodness. And he bled out. And I, I, and I wasn't there. So I'd imagine that he cut his juggler vein. Yeah. And he bled out. Sonny was like 16 years old. Why? 16, maybe 17 years old. Um. <laughs> It was, it was, it was a tragedy. And I remember wanting to come up and uh, my father said, no, you just stay, stay there. You, you're fine. Don't, you know, you know, mm -hmm. so I stayed and I'm glad because at the funeral service, it was chaos. I'm sure. Guys came, they were drinking, you know, you know how we do. And then the funeral, this is, this is, I'm glad I wasn't there. The funeral director did not involve him. The mm. funeral director was drinking, was a drunk too. And he told the family and those gathered, I will throw this bleep, bleep, bleep out in the street. Mm. That's what the funeral director said. Wow. And of course, I think my dad was there. My dad was not a dream. You know, he was like, you know, what, what are you saying, man? You know, what are you talking about? I don't give a, and the funeral director was all off base. Mm -hmm. And so some of our friends took it to heart. And they threw Molotov cocktails into this man's room. What? It was chaos. That's crazy. Alcohol and drugs. Alcohol and drugs would do it. You know, I, I've wondered over the years, um, my friend, I, I really wanted, I used to walk through harm. Uh, and I used to look and I, I say, wow, what would our communities look like? What would our families look like if we didn't have more uh, liquor stores mm. on the block? Mm. What, 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 how is it that liquor stores can stay open almost all, all year round? No one, no one, you don't hear of too many liquor stores <laughs> being being, uh, you know, uh, in situations where someone's coming in to hold them up in a sense because they keep things coming. You know, I, I just wonder what would 
it looked like in our communities and families uh, if it wasn't like that. It used to be that, you know, you could walk down the street in Harlem, streets in Harlem, and you find two and three churches on the block. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. You, you, you can't find that. You find more liquor stores than That's you right. would in the church almost now, oh. you know? And and so it, it has caused me to really wonder what kind of impact the depth of this that's happening because it becomes it can become generational. It can become a cycle and it and, yep. and it yep. and there's some some situations where it's like it passes down, if you will, to the next person and and someone and that leads to abuse or domestic violence and all sorts of other things. And, you know, the children who see and they grow up in homes like this, and it, it, it just, it's a lot. I think that in our community, I would say, we, we need to see some change uh, in these areas because I believe it is destroying, contributing to the destruction of the family, the destruction of wholesome relationships, uh, the destructions of all sorts of institutions. Even in the, even, I mean, this is how I think one of the reasons how we got, um, you know, in, in, in corporate America, I remember when I was working in human resource management, one of the, the, the issues that changed was Christmas parties, because mm. when you go to Christmas parties, that's when the, the, the VP wanted to talk a little bit more to uh, one of the, the staff, female staff. And then you get sexual harassment issues and it's because everybody's getting high or they're drinking, mm -hmm. not everyone, mm -hmm. you understand. Some people didn't know how to, they couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle what they were drinking or what they were taking. And that becomes the time where the behavior changes, the conduct has changed, everybody's out there. And then uh, then you got more problems, legal issues. So it, it just it's just wonderful how this thing called alcohol mm. to get to the state of drunkenness, how that impacts so many uh circles in our lives you know no doubt no no doubt about it, it it's it's um one of the one of our viewers said it's a vicious cycle and it is a vicious cycle mm. and, and so and, and it and it can it can run through families i know your 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 dissertation and your work with family is very very important and it's interesting because i didn't think about your background when i was writing this but your but what you studied and what you do in your ministry really aligns itself with what we're talking about tonight because you want to bring healing to the family and 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 help them to to destroy that legacy and it's interesting because as as african american as you talked about being orangeburg you know uh, uh picking south carolina charleston mm -hmm. south carolina these places where our history is tied into slavery mm -hmm. and, and all of all of the negativity that went along with that and all of the, the 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 psychological pressures that could have led easily to drinking, you know, uh, uh, the Bible talks about you know give them give them wine, you know, to help them sort of settle their spirits and stuff like that, just just to help them forget their trouble. Um, right. So so it's easy to fall into that, and then once you into it, to stay into it because you know uh, the the pain is so deep that you rather stay drunk than come out of it and deal with the reality. Yep. And one of the things I always look at is this, is that in order, when I was, when I was drinking and I wanted to stay high, you got to keep drinking. Hmm. You can't stay high unless you keep drinking. Unless you keep drinking. Right? You, if you, if you sniffing cocaine, which lasts only that long, you see these crackheads, they out there all stealing because they're trying to maintain that high, but you can't do it unless you keep unless you keep smoking, unless you keep drinking. You have to do that in order to maintain. And the flip side of all of that, and we'll talk about that in the second hour for sure. But and the flip side is that if you're filled with the spirit, hmm. right? Yeah. How do you stay filled with the spirit? Keep drinking. <laughs> keep drinking. You yeah. can't ever, you, if you come away from the fountain, right? then you can get caught up in the old world because that's your, that's your norm. You know, that's our, that's our, um, uh, 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 you know, common denominator is life. So, right. so we can easily revert back to what we knew before because that's always going to be there. So in order to stay in the word, we got to stay at the fountain. 
we got to be drinking all the time. And we should. We definitely need that. Um, and like I know, I'm sure you probably want to cover a little bit more of that uh, in, in, in the second second hour. But it, it is um, something to think about how we can be controlled by whatever that substance is versus being con- or, or drunk with wine. And therefore, uh, if we're drunk with wine, we're out of control mm. versus being drunk with the spirit. We were under control. If that makes sense to you. Yes, sir. You know, so 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 if I if I'm if I'm drunk with wine, then my conduct is is out there. You know, I can right. do anything. But right. like you said, we got to keep drinking from the fountain that God gives us in the Spirit, and that allows us to be under control of God or of God's Spirit. There are so many man. I I, I think that there's so many um, reasons why people. Uh, get to the state where they can get hooked or get drunk. I, and I get it. You know, I'm, I don't look down at anybody because it's mm-hmm. all about God's grace, right? And 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 because someone takes a sip of wine doesn't mean that they're going to hell, you know? Right, so, right. And, and I know that everybody has different theological positions mm-hmm. on this, but uh, there are issues in life that can push people to the point where they end up getting drunk. And I get it, right? But that's where I think our faith comes in, uh, which may mean some people may need some counseling. They may need some, yeah. may need some therapy and Jesus, as they yes, say, sir. you yes, know, sir. and that helps them to to walk through because um, there's so many pressures, you know, out here until people can really find themselves turning to something else to change, try to change their environment when it, it's it's not necessarily changing it, but from in their mind, they're thinking that they're changing it because they're getting intoxicated. And what's really interesting about that is that um, we now use legal means to do the same thing. Doctors right. will prescribe medications to you to take you out of your normal state of thinking and give you a point so that you can quote unquote relax, right? Yep. So now we have a legal means to do, I mean, alcohol is legal, marijuana is legal, um, prescription drugs are legal. But if you drive and you are taking a prescribed medication that has, that alters your natural state of being and you have an accident, you're charged with the same crime you would have been charged with if you were drinking and driving. Yeah. So just because it's legal doesn't give you the legal right to drive or to do any other thing if you are impaired. Impairment is impairment in the eyes of the law, legally, right? So so you don't get a pass because you're taking medication. You don't get a pass. You go to jail, same yep. way anybody else would. Yep. Same way anybody else would. So so I, I want to I say that because I don't want anybody to get it twisted, right? Um, you may be on medication legally, but it doesn't exempt you from being charged criminally. Exactly. Exactly, man. I, 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 I mean, I, and that, I mean, I'm not an expert on cannabis. I, 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 that, that's, that, that's not my area, but I'm just looking at it. And I just wonder between that and other, other things that we're looking at that tonight that can distort behavior and there's some people that need it because of health situations i get that and they legitimately need that it's prescribed for them but then you just wonder you know when you look at the law and the history and the the people that are in prison now Mm -hmm. doing time for this for a little something that they had and now it's become it's okay to i don't know to me it's become confusing you know Mm. uh and i think that like you you're sharing Right now, what you just said is key is that, you know, still got to realize, hey, listen, if, you, if you're if you driving and, and you're, you're going to pay the price, you know. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. And, and a lot of times people, I think, over, overlook it. Uh, but uh, we have we have to do something to uh, get our minds uh, in alignment today. This is just me, my own personal opinions. I just feel that we as a, we as a nation, we as a people, we have to get ourselves in line in such a way where we're thinking upward, that we're focused, 
that we're not uh, intoxicated in with 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 what's happening of of the social that aspect of social life where it's to the extreme while everything is happening right in front of us whether it's political whether it's social whether it's economical we miss the whole thing because you know we're what drunk with the the, the, the wine of the world as the hymn writer says right. you know uh, so I, I, there's a lot behind this, man. It's what's your article, man. I tell you what you wrote in the scripture that you selected. It really is mind boggling. It, it's a lot. It can stretch you to really just really reflect and see where we are as a nation, where we are as a church, um, you know, uh, in, in community. Uh, what, 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 how, how focused are we? Are we really looking at what's happening or are we just drifting? And are we numb? Because that that that's what that what that's what happens a lot of times. I I have a uh, I remember coming up at funerals. Now you know our people, our culture and funerals. Somebody's always going to get drunk at the repast. Oh, no doubt about it. <laughs> somebody's always gonna get before drunk they get to the repast. Church. Sometimes they come to the church, come to the <laughs> yeah. come to the funeral home, drunk, hanging all over the casket, dripping <laughs> up. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> and I'll never forget. I my, we had a cousin. Um, who would always, after the funeral, he comes to the funeral, he's drunk, family gets together, and he would always somehow try to find something to argue about. Mm. He always find, I don't, I don't know why, I don't, I knew nothing else about him, but that he was always arguing. Whenever I saw him that one time when we had the, those, those times we have funerals, family mm. funerals come together, he is tall and he's arguing. And everybody and everybody's you know carrying on over here. I, is that what we need? You, you you know, is that what we need as a family or as a community? How, how do we come out of that? You know, yeah. and so I mean, we have the answer. I really believe that. Like I said, Jesus and a therapist, if that's what it takes. But um, I just find that those are some of the ills uh, that can just it stymies us. It hinders us from growing in so many ways, individually, personally, you know. Uh, but anyway, I'll leave that right there. Well, that, that's a good place to leave it. I'm, uh, we're, about, we're about one minute to, to the top of the hour. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, we're gonna share my screen again. I'm gonna recognize those advertisers and sponsors that work with us and help us to do what we do here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, and you can do likewise, I'm gonna go ghost for just a minute. And okay. then uh, go ahead and recognize all of the sponsors and advertisers. I'm going to read the article again. Ask the challenge question again, because I want you guys to really think about this question, because I really want you, this is where we're going to get into the things that you're saying as, 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 as a, part of the, a part of the audience and a part of the participating audience. You know, I like to think that when we start this, you are a fly on the wall, but when we end it, you are part of the conversation. So I want you to answer this challenge question as we go forward so that we will be able to have a dialogue, uh, not just not just uh, uh, James and myself, but you also. So 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 let's recognize the sponsors and advertisers and let's come back and let's bring you into our conversation. Don't forget to support our advertisers and our sponsors, the JLR Company and J. Lauren Russell Consulting LLC for all of your church financial consulting needs check out our website, www.jlorenrussellconsulting.com. That's www.jlorenrussellconsulting.com. Or simply give us a call, 718-328-8096. 718-328-8096. If you want to train your trustees, if you want to develop your property, if you need a church loan, give us a call. We'll be there to help. Matters of Faith, the book can be purchased at my cash app, dollar sign matters of faith. The cost of the book is $22.80. That's $22.80. You can send your check of money order to the JLR company, post office box 301, New York, New York, 10035. That's post office box 301, New York, New York, 10035. Get the book. It will absolutely bless your life. You can also get it as an ebook. All you need to do is go to www.smashwords.com backslash books backslash view backslash 993177. That's www.smashwords.com backslash books backslash view backslash 993177. 
the book has no shipping and handling if you get it as an ebook. And also check out the Eat Okra app for all black owned restaurants all over the nation. That's right, Eat Okra. And finally, subscribe, like, and share our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. Make sure that you subscribe, like, and share our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. Let me add just one more thing. Get your subscription to Better Mag Magazine today. A two-year subscription is only $27.50. That's www.abettermag.com. www.abettermag.com. And now the article for the last time tonight, Intoxicated in the Spirit. That article can be found in my column, Matters of Faith, at the Bronx Chronicle, www.thebronxchronicle.com. It can also be found in the Yonkers Insider, www.yonkersinsider.blogspot.com. You can also find it in Better Mag Magazine, www.abettermag.com, Black Westchester Magazine, and Pamela's Big Heart Newsletter intoxicated in the spirit ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 to 21 the amplified bible therefore see that you walk carefully living life with honor purpose and courage shunning those who tolerate and enable evil not as the unwise but as wise sensible intelligent discerning people making the very most of your time on earth recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence, because the days are filled with evil. Therefore, do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness, corruption, stupidity. But be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by Him. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, offering praise by singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord always giving thanks to God the Father for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Intoxicated in the Spirit. I remember when I was a young man, actually, I was a teenager, drinking with friends. I don't remember how much they drank, but I would routinely drink until I was thoroughly inebriated. What started as a buzz became a drunken stupor. It was the cool thing to do, so we would drink regularly, sometimes resulting in us cussing and fighting each other. It always fascinates me when I think back to my days of drinking and consuming other mind-altering substances, how committed I was to spending time and money to acquire the substances, taking the time to consume them, the time it took to be under their influence, and of course, the recovery time. I must admit, many of those episodes I cannot recall, even though each one consumed somewhere around 8 to 12 hours, and who knows how much money, all in pursuit of a good time. I finally came to my senses and recognized that I was wasting my most precious gifts on something that was literally robbing and killing me at the same time. The Apostle Paul understood that there were many people whose interests were in drunkenness. He admonishes his readers to be wise and seek the understanding and to understand the will of God for their lives. He quickly tells them not to be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. The capitalization of the word Spirit indicates the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What follows in his discourse is the results of being filled with the Spirit as opposed to being drunk with wine. Drunken stupors versus speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, being helpful to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul was right. Being intoxicated with wine leads to hangovers, early morning dry mouth, lots of wasted time, wasted resources, misused talents, and squandered money. But when you are intoxicated with the Spirit of God, you sing songs of praise to God from the heart. You give thanks to God the Father for all things. And in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you love others the way the Lord loves you. If you're going to be intoxicated, get drunk in the word of God. The experience is amazing and the rewards are eternal. Be blessed. 
Now, here's my question again for the last time tonight. And I do want you to listen to it because this is a question that should really challenge your faith. In what ways are the so-called saints of God who are not intoxicated in the spirit creating more damage in the church than those who are drunk from the wine of the world? One more time. In what ways are the so-called saints of God who are not intoxicated in the spirit creating more damage in the church than those who are drunk from the wine of the world? Well, you heard me introduce him because I read his bio. I didn't read all of it. I read some of it. But there's so much more to this man than can be captured on a piece of paper. And so, Matters of Faith family, would you welcome with me again for the second part, the second half of this broadcast tonight, my friend, my colleague, my brother. Yeah, yeah, the brother who was born on the same day I was, the day that we shared together. This awesome man of God, Reverend Dr. James B. Logan. All right, I'm back. He'll be back in just a second, too. There he is. Okay, here we go. Hey, I wanted to. Um, I'm going to share some of the things that have been said, but I wanted to share just um, before we broke, um, two things came to mind. One was when, when, when friends would die back in the day, family as well. You know what one of our traditions was? <laughs> Putting a bottle of alcohol in the casket with them. Yeah. Yeah. You have seen anybody do that? We do that all the time. I, I would... I... I the closest I saw that was not necessarily in the casket, but at of course at the cemetery, pouring out liquor on the on the graveside. Yeah, the grave no, we side. put it we put it in the casket, put the bottle, put in it the right casket. there, right next, right in his arms. Yeah, that's him. That's his. That's his that wine. Was... His gypsy rose. Wow, <laughs> wild Irish rose. Now Nine, that all twenty twenty Swiss up. I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. Wow, kids, wow. and th and then then. It was another thing that we did and we i didn't know what it was at the time but we would drink and we would take a cap and we'd fill it with alcohol and we say this is for the brothers that have passed on we pour libations mm -hmm. which is which is an african tradition right i don't know how we picked it up but we used to do that pour a drop you know for the brothers who passed on the spirits of the brothers who passed on so we created these things that were that had some connection to the spirit while we were doing these other things that had all the the, the, the you know semblances of being in a world of of depravity That's so right. i just wanted to share those two things because just kind of popped into my mind and i didn't forget them That's but I wanted, to, I wanted to share some of the things that we, and i'm gonna I'm give you a chance just to share but there were some interesting comments that have been made so far um, that, that I saw. Um, one of them, um, uh, Brenda said that she she remembers the ice truck and the, she ate red clay and red clay dirt and the spirits of turpentine on spoons followed up uh, with orange or maybe even an apple. <laughs> so wow. She remembers those days. And, uh -huh. then, uh, and then a friend, Andrew, used to work with me he said he was born in Harlem and raised in the South Bronx too and then he said something interesting he said in 1969 when I came home from Vietnam I used drugs until 1996 and then God stepped in and I got clean and sober now I have 27 years clean and 12 years cigarette free amen amen now, and he and I worked together and at the time I think when we met when we, we used to work together I had stopped smoking cigarettes Mm -hmm. I started smoking cigarettes when I was 14 years old. I got permit. Matter of fact, I got permission to smoke when I was 12. Because mm -hmm. my father said, well, if you're going to smoke, don't be smoking outside hiding. So you smoke here. That's right. So so he he was a smart man. He, he, uh, <laughs> he brought me a carton of cigarettes every week. Mm -hmm. I had so many cigarettes. I, mean, I, I, did, I, I couldn't smoke them. So I would give them away. So, which was good because I never, I developed a habit, but I was able to break it. Break it, right, right. You know, and it was amazing because I, you know, my father was, a, was had, had some genius in him. And then er Erica says something interesting. She says, my immediate family were alcoholics. Very traumatizing for my siblings mm -hmm. and I to watch. 
And I have to thank God for my beloved mother who would talk to us so much about God and about what he likes and doesn't like. And I can say I was one of the lucky ones that because of the fear of God put into us, I remain the one that never, ever buckled to peer pressure. Mm. Greatest blessings. Wow. It's awesome. Awesome yep. testimony. Yeah, it is. It is. And then, and this is um, um, uh, a response to that was you are the inspiration for all. Mm. And then Erica said again, it was a vicious cycle. And then and the Margaret said, and Margaret is a friend of mine that we just reconnected. I hadn't spoken to her in years. She called me today, didn't know who I was, but I recognize who she is. And she's with us tonight. She says the liquor stores were open during COVID. During COVID, isn't that something? Only thing that was open. That's Only that's thing. Right. Everything are closed. Liquor stores were open. That's right. And they were saying that they needed that to help people to deal with the lack yep. of uh, socialization. Yep. Mm hmm Yep. 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 And then let's see. Um, she said, I I'm not going to do it. Uh, 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 um, Miss Thompson, my friend, I I've known, I've known Louise since I was in kindergarten. She says, I do not allow alcohol in my home. Mm. I want my home to be a safe haven for those that might be trying to stop drinking. Mm. Sometimes people won't say I'm struggling. I come from a family of alcoholics. Mm. It's not an easy thing to watch. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then Deborah says, let the spirit guide you. And then mm. and, and my cousin says, vaping, hookah, legal marijuana, medical marijuana, many more. And um, in reference to elementary schools, new languages, slang used in schools and writing, dress codes in schools, babies twerking as a norm and can't even spell, sign of the times, times for the children's parents who are afloat mentally with substance abuse, whatever it may be. Hmm. And I think we were talking about um, um, medical um, uses of, of, of medicines or, or prescribed medicines, and you can, you know, be charged with that. Right. And, um, and, and Margaret says she didn't know about that. She didn't know that that was, that she says, I, I didn't know that. Um, but yeah, that, that's true. Um, so, um, yep. Let's see. Um, Louise says, I stopped buying cigarettes when cigarettes and tokens went up to $1. Hmm. It was economics for me. I had to get work. <laughs> so it was interesting. When I stopped smoking cigarettes, cigarettes were 75 cents a pack. And I thought that was too much. 75 cents a pack. I thought that was way too much. Because wow. when I first started smoking cigarettes, they're like 35 cents a pack. And it was 75 cents. I'm not spending 75 cents on those cigarettes. Crazy. That's crazy. Mm -mm -mm. Now they're what, $10? Isn't that something? Mm -mm -mm. And, and 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 uh and my cousin says i'm proud of myself never indulge in drug never that's mm -hmm. amazing that's one, that's one of my cousins i don't know how in the world she <laughs> <laughs> my family is listen every single time we got together that's all that's all it was there's alcohol table full of alcohol uh, uh fights and stuff like that but but now i wanted to flip the script i really wanted to flip the script because i get it Right, we 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 have these backgrounds that are full of um, um, problems, you know, drugs and alcohol and 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 history and 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 a lot of a lot of um, abuses, you know. Um, we don't talk about it a lot, but we have a lot of incest in our communities. Yeah, we have lot we have lots of problems, and so to turn to substance as a way of relief. It's not something that we want to condemn people for because you have to find some sort of relief because sometimes it'll drive you crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So I get that. But what I'm advocating for tonight is not to use the substance that will get you inebriated, but drink from the fountain that will get you drunk in the spirit of the Lord. I, I want to flip the script and say, how do we get people from 
taking drugs and alcohol as a remedy for pain and, 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 and the other things in life, the, the, the vicissitudes of life, and see the spirit of God as being the answer to all of your issues. That, wow. That's what I want to try to get to. I don't know if we're going to be able to make it there. <laughs> that we're <gonna> try. <laughs> that's what I want to get to. That's what I want to do. Wow. I'll Are you asking that question? You. Huh? Are you asking me that question? Yes. Yeah. You know, um, wow, that's a loaded question, man. Um, I, I would say, though, that it takes a lot of thought and structure to be able to expose. And here we go back to uh, young people, family, relationships. We as a people, um, it is our faith mm. and trusting God that brought us through. I know that um, if we think about slavery, um, there were some praying people back then. That's right. There's no way in the world some of the things happened the way they did unless somebody wasn't praying. I know that there were different uh, various prayers and, uh, you know, they used to have their, our, our, our forefathers and foremothers, they used to have their own types of services in the bushes and all of that. We read and study about that. Somebody was praying. And, and even we go back to Big Mama and the Big Daddies. They were praying for us that we would get to where we are today. And somewhere along the line, the transference of faith has, has been broken. It did not mm. continue to flow. And so we have a lot of people who are open to a lot of things. So we have to, I think today, the way it is, it's not going to be that you bring somebody to church like they made, like people did years ago. You bring your child to church and you make them come to church and they're going to sit there and listen to the pre. It, it, it's not going to be like that today. It's hard to get people just come to church anyway, but we have to reimagine ministry, mm. uh, see how to make it relevant for where people are today, whether there are various ministries within the church that help people that may be alcoholics, number one, or have some kind of substance abuse. Uh, we also have to help people to see how they can improve within themselves through scripture, through worship, through wholesome environments. And I, I want to say, too, I've been thinking about this, uh, man, that we have to get people, you know, this term of getting people in proper rooms mm -hmm. or exposing people to different environments that will help bring out the best in them, whether it's getting them into some circles. Uh, for example, you get some people who really desire to, uh, they might be musically inclined, they might be technically inclined, but we need to get them into uh, some circles where they can hear that. Mm. They, you know, whether they wanna be athletic or whatever it is, whatever their ability is, they have to be exposed to that. And while we're doing that, simultaneously giving them the word of God, exposing them to worship, genuine worship, I think the combination or a holistic approach, it makes, this makes it all possible. Mm -hmm. Because if you just, if we just say Jesus only, and we never look at the other side of what a person may be dealing with and sit down and have real life conversation, you know, like you sharing your testimony with someone. And saying, hey, listen, man, this is what happened to me and God brought me and I'm sharing my testimony. This level of transparency is some, is, has, mm -hmm. has been often lost. You know, we used to have testimony, testimony right. services, right. you know, and people were listening. People were paying attention and they said, wow, if that could happen to them, maybe there's hope for me. People don't know what I'm dealing with, but I heard uh, Deacon so-and-so, Deaconess so-and-so, the pastor, whoever the person is. And, they, they, and there's some identification and some hope instilled. And so that helps drive home this faith um, that gives, that empowers us to be able to bring change in our lives and get connected with God. So that's just a short answer, but uh, I, that's one thing I see is needed. Reimagining ministry to make sure that there is a holistic approach to addressing these needs so that people get what they need, whether it's the therapy, or whether it's just having conversation, whether it's the testimony, mm -hmm. but then at the same time, get the word of God, you know, so that they're sitting at the fountain, if you will, to hear, uh, and because the word of God is transformative, 
Uh, I used to hear a preacher said, you know, it's, it's, this is the word of God. And I remember hearing this exact term that they use. One could be on a bar stool turning around, somebody could come in and present the word of God. And that person on that bar stool can get up, get out of there and their whole life can be changed all by the word of God, mm. you know? And so I just believe, I just, that's one of my, but that's a short answer, but that's what I think needs to happen. I think you're great. I think it's, you know, I think you're right on point. Um, let me share with you a couple of things that have been coming in, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, when you give your testimony and people see that you're going through rough times, but you never lost your faith, hope and belief in God, it's inspiring and it gives them hope that they too can overcome whatever comes their way. And then Louise says, we can start with our family. No alcohol at the family union and family gatherings. That's right. For at least a few hours. Stop drinking alcohol around our children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I totally agree with that. I think that, you know, we have to sort of change the paradigm. Yes. We have to change the narrative. In order to change the narrative, we got to stop doing some things. We got to break something you know what i'm saying we have to we have to change it so the question that i asked tonight right in what ways are the so-called saints of god who are not intoxicated in the spirit creating more damage in the church and this and, and in our community as well than those who are drunk from the wine of the world hmm. now what do i mean by that you have people who are literally sitting in congregations going to church have been doing that for years but they're not they're not full of the holy spirit they, right. they're, they're void of it in fact we know who the drunks are we know what can we can expect from them right we know that they have certain issues that they have to deal with that we can actually help them to overcome right because right. you know we can stop drinking in front of them. We can do some things to help them. We can get them, as you said, uh, uh, my, 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 uh, Reverend Doctor, you, you know, we we can refer them to us to to therapy. We right. can put them in some sort of a uh, alcoholic recovery program or right. Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. We have some remedies for that. But what do you do about those people in the church hmm. that, that that avoid of the Holy Spirit? But they're there all the time. Yeah. What do we do yeah. with them? They yeah. they ain't no therapy groups. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, it, it's a challenge, Reverend. I I um I'm 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 I have a very uh I, I'm gonna put this to try to put this right. This summer there's been a burden in my heart for the church. Mm. And when I say for the church, the church at large, the church uh, all together, the body of Christ, all the local congregations that make up the, the, the church, right? I have a burden uh, for our church. And one of the things that I see happening in churches, and I hear it from conversations of the pastors and clergy alike, is just what you're, the question that you're raising is just what's happening. And it may be the sign of the times mm -hmm. uh, that we're finding more people are who are in church, but the church is not in them. Uh, and, and so therefore they do create more damage because their conduct is unbecoming of, of, of the character and nature of Christ. And so therefore they, they will walk in the flesh. They're carnal, they're religious. Mm -hmm. They look the part, they sound the part. Mm -hmm. They know when to say amen. They know when to stand up, they can clap. They might have a title. They may have been serving in a position for years. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if what, what you're saying is if they're not intoxicated um, in the spirit and they're in this environment, which someone coming say, oh, I can find peace here. I can find help. I can find mm -hmm. hope. They end up, based on their character and conduct, they turn people off and run people actually yes, right sir. outside of the place yes, of hope. Sir. So the person is coming with substance abuse or whatever the issue is, just just trying to better themselves. They want to get closer to God. Now, I, let me put a little footnote here. I love the church. 
Right. I, I want to make that clear. I love the church. I think it's the best thing. I think that the church will always stand because of Christ, right? But I do believe that we have to really examine what we're doing, how we're doing it. It may mean that we have to provide more teaching today. Mm. There has to be more teaching so that people understand transformation. Many people come down the aisles, Reverend, as I know you know this, and for years we say the doors of the church are open. What does that really mean? Mm. They come down the aisle, they shake the preacher's hand, as we say, they go in the back and somebody takes their address and telephone number, we'll call you and come in. No one said a prayer with them, or mm. they said a prayer, but that person never really uh, confessed Christ. They never right. admitted right. ABCs, admit, uh, admit our sin and believe that God has raised you from the dead mm. and confess him as Lord. They never go through that whole transformational thing. They just going through the right. steps. And they go right. through what so therefore we're not dealing with the inner man, the, the their spirit, so to speak, to help them to grow spiritually. So therefore they fall into that category of becoming saints of God, so to speak, who are not intoxicated spirit, right? Or they're people that they they're exposed to Christ or they accept Christ, but they're babies, they never grew, they never went back to the fountain, they never stayed right. at the right. fountain, right. they're still on milk. They've been in they've been in the church for 30, 40 years, and they can only say, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. That's all, that's the only verse that they know. That's a problem because then they're walking around, uh, their 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 hypes of their oh, what's the good word to use? They're babes in Christ. They are that they're they're um I want to think they never grew. So right. this the malnourished, they're <laughs> underdeveloped, yeah. and yeah. they are they they're crippled. Yeah. And so therefore you have people who are coming into the church looking for faith to grow and they, they don't get that. So that's a problem. Mm. But again, I go back to say the solution. Part of it is training, teaching, not uh, put being so fast to put people in positions who really are still uh, mm. learning themselves so that they don't get in the forefront and run people out or do more damage to those who are trying to find help. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. It makes great sense. A great sense because you come into a, an environment looking for help, looking for a place where you can find solace, solace mm -hmm. for, your, for, your, for your aching heart. And you run into someone who is a buzzsaw. Yep. And they poison you. And you say, well, wait a minute. The drunks that I just left, at least they know what I'm going through. They have yeah. sympathy for me. If, if, if I ain't got no money, they give me a drink. That's right. You know, I mean, I come here and you don't even let me come in the door. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so so it's interesting. Let me tell you what Ron said. Ron said, minds will be manipulated by the wolves in sheep clothing, as they did from the times of Genesis. Individuals fail to study God's teaching on their own. We lift up those wolves, musicians, so-called prophets, deacons, and on the pulpit, TV, et cetera, because they convince individuals that God only speaks to them. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is power, and once you have it, no one can take it away. Are you aware that Christ did not want his followers to be educated? Uh, let me see, is that right? Did not want his followers to be educated and to be able to read? Stained glass windows told stories and helped educate and teach illiterate individuals. Hold on for a second, I missed it. Uh, illiterate individuals, white gloves, and the hand behind the back were signs in the Baptist church of oppression. The white church did not want the black ushers to have contact with them, yet it still takes place. There's a lack of wisdom. And so uh, uh, Ron has given us a little history about what happens in the church and how some things take place and how they transpire. And then um, he said, there are 1,200 religious denominations in the USA alone. Hmm. He wrote, divide and conquer. <laughs> keep them separate, keep them apart, keep them from understanding that we are truly one. Mm. Really one. And that's interesting because, you know, this matters of faith is not a denomination, right? Matters of faith is about faith. And, 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 and it's about the Lord. How do you serve the Lord? How do you come to a better relationship? How do you grow 
in your relationship with the Lord, with God, with Christ? How do you do that? So it's a very practical way of looking at our faith and putting it into action so that we can be the persons that God created us to be and do the things that he wants us to do. But it's not in the doing, it's in the being. It is. And so how do we teach that? When you get people who literally you teach that have been in the church, as you say, 20, 30, 40 years, and you teach them and they refuse to be taught. Hmm. Wow. They just don't move. They won't get, they won't let you teach them. Yeah. I, 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 I believe that uh, as under shepherds, as pastors, we have responsibility to teach. Uh, and some people, the reality is some people are not going to accept it. Some people are going to refuse it. Some people will never really grow. They're going to stay stagnant. Uh, but we should continue presenting the word of God. And the truth is, this is, and this is where I'm sure it might be, some people might look at it differently, but from what I am seeing today in churches and talking to other pastors, some people should not be elevated. Some people should not be put mm. in positions at all. Some mm. people need to be sat down. We have gotten away from sitting people down properly mm. to, uh, and, and removing them from uh, disrupting a congregation. These, you know, there's a way to for it to be done biblically, and according to to dominant denomination, every denomination has some right. code of conduct, some discipline process, and that's something we have gotten. We I think we have shied away from that because we're trying to be inclusive. We don't want to hurt someone's feelings, you know. But today, people are very bold. They're going to tell you what they don't feel, they don't believe. They're going to discourage people. We're in the church. So we need to have strong conversations with them. We need to have training and development. Yep. Uh, just like in the business world, their training and development, we need to have that more so in the church. And I, I go back to the Bible again, talk about faith, and that's how we get our faith. There needs to be classes or, 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 or in-depth Bible study in, in dip, on various topics that attract people, that appeal mm. to people so that people can see it being relevant to where they are, making mm. it applicable for where they are, you know, even sermons, sermons, you know, I'm, and, this, and this is me, I've always been one where I believe in teaching, preaching, at least that's my, my call and personal conviction. It does, it, for me to get up and in front of people and say, and speak proper and because I have education, you know, come up with all of that, that's not, that's not getting it. People may understand, I could use all sorts of uh, big words and all of that, but if people are not understanding what it is that one is saying and how they can apply that to their lives, transformation cannot really occur. It has to happen with people. The word gets in and it brings transformation of the mind and the heart, and we'll see it eventually in the life. But in dealing with uh, the people that you're mentioning, there has to be, I would say, some really restructuring or maybe just re-implementation of what's been already out there, of, 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 of being able to sit down and talk with people who are very unruly uh, to and get the agreement of the body to have this done. Because some churches know that these are the things that we need. Everybody knows who's the troublemaker in a church, right? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows it. But no one does anything about it because right. they're intimidated. They they feel fearful. Uh, is what some people use the term church mafia that's in there. You know, mm. they're in there and they make it difficult for other people to come up and to say this is not right. But we're at a time now where uh, we we don't have time to waste. Um, this is critical for uh, I believe this generation to get faith and development in Christ rethink, reimagine, whatever words you want to use, we need to do it and we need to do it now to get people to look at ministry uh, differently. But yet, in other words, we change the, the method, but not the mission. The mission is still Christ mm -hmm. and people need Christ and we have to make sure we get it in that way. I, I thank you. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. I think you hit the nail right on the head. I think we also... We, in addition to everything that you've said, we, we have to also recognize, like alcoholics, right? Mm -hmm. Until you recognize that you have an issue, mm. you won't seek help. No. 
So somehow or another, in our preaching and our teaching and our comradeship, because sometimes the preacher will never be able to expose the person to what's wrong because they're, they're resistant to it. They've already made up their mind, not going to listen to that. But someone sitting in the pew right next to them might be the person that can open their eyes to it and say, you know, you need help. You, 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 you are really, you know, you are being destructive and, and you're being counterproductive. You need help. Maybe it comes from someone outside of the pulpit. Mm -hmm. So it takes a concern. You know, if, if we concern ourselves with the well-being of, of our brethren and our sisters, then we will tell them the things that they need to hear. Now, I, I, I've been saying for years, and I'm going to continue to say this. I don't care if you like me or not. I really don't care because your liking me has very little to do with me being able to help you um, work out your soul salvation. Right. Right. Because my responsibility, even if I'm not a preacher, if, 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 if I see someone going in the wrong mm -hmm. direction, I'm supposed to help them to see the error of the way just so that they can get back in line or get in line because I don't want to see them miss the mark and lose their eternal soul. Mm -hmm. For me, it's the eternal soul that's most important. Exactly. You, only, you only dislike me for a minute. That ain't going to mm -hmm. last. But mm -hmm. eternity is long. Yep. You miss it. Hell is hot. Yep. <laughs> So, yep. so I don't mind if you don't like me, but I'm going to share with you what I've got. And I'm going to try to do it in a way that can get your attention and get you to more than anything else to think. When I used to work with young people, teenagers in particular, one of the things I discovered is that they can't act and think at the same time. Hmm. They can't. If you get them thinking, they'll literally freeze in their tracks. They'll stop right where they are if you get them to think. So the, the way you get a person to think is by asking them a question. Ask a person a question and it makes them stop because now you got to process that question. Teenagers don't always have all the tools necessary to process the information and continue to do what they're doing. They process the information, they stop and say, whoa, that's a question. Well, if I get you to engage the question, I can get you to change your mind. Right. If I can't get you to think, there's very little I can do with you to help you to change your behavior. It won't work. Mm -hmm. First thing, get them to think. So here, here's, here's Daryl said this. So I'm reminded that one mandate of a doctor is to do no harm. I'm not so sure that being a bystander is a harmful life, but it is certainly is certain that it is not a helpful one. It's a mindset of, I got mine, you better get yours. The problem with that is that they are trees that do not bear fruit, rain clouds without rain. Jesus cursed a freak tree that had no fruit on it because it had the appearance of being fruitful. Yet, in fact, there was no fruit there. The saints are not only tasked with staying connected to God, they are also required to share what they have received from him with others. This is how we participate in the flow of God's love to mankind. Hmm. That's good. That's good, right? Yep. So, so we have to be more, you know, um, we have to be more engaged because some people, as you say, they don't want to say it because, you know, it's the church mafia. They, they, they've got this click going on and you don't want to, you don't want to disturb anybody. You don't want to say anything to upset people and all that kind of stuff. And so we sit there and when good people do nothing, bad things always happen. Yeah, you're right. Always, always. Good people do nothing. Terrible things take place. Churches literally will die because good people do nothing. 
Yeah. You know, I, I remember when I was, uh, you know, I grew up in the church, as you know, and I remember, <clears throat> it may seem like a, a small incident or episode, but a young man who I remember uh, was, he was white, he was, he was coming to church mm -hmm. and he was my friend. Mm. Um, I was a young kid and he came in, you know, back then you come to church early because we had like an eight o'clock service mm -hmm. and, you know, for youth Sunday. Right. Mm -hmm. So he came in with the wrong attire on. He was supposed mm. to have one out like dark suit, white shirt, whatever. He came in like with a blue shirt. And one of the persons told him who was leader said, what are you doing here? What, why did you come with that blue shirt? You know, you're supposed to, that young man ran right down the steps of my church. You know, Convent, those front steps. Mm -hmm. that he ran. I didn't see him for about another 10 years. Wow. He stopped coming to church all. Now, here's a good example of what you was talking about. Uh, now, now he, his life was changed just like that. Didn't want to be have anything to do with the church for 10 years. He was a good young man, you know, mm -hmm. but all because someone who was in leadership in the church who was not sitting at this fountain that you're talking about right, right, so their, right. their conduct wasn't reflective of that and you know when people are like that they are out of they can get out of control they can damage the church the bible talks about people who are like that in the church and i just believe like you said we have to really get a, a good handle a better handle on that mm. and some churches are good at having counseling uh, for people to make this uh to provide to come alongside people to help them with their issues and developing leadership skills or whatever it is, whatever their personality issues are, so that it won't be like, like you said, the pulpit telling them, hey, you can't do this here, or but they will have someone to sort of walk them through and help them to flesh out whatever issues that they're dealing with. But other than that, they will continue, if we don't watch it, they will continue to be a hindrance to those who are trying to get help and, and hinder the ministry from growing and being mm. productive as well. Louise says something interesting. I like what she said. Mm -hmm. She says, it's a money thing in some churches. Money. Before, they say, they, she said, they give people a pass because they're big titles. <laughs> See, I, 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 I do finance, you know that, I, I, I do finance, I right. train trustees, I do all that kind of stuff. I can tell you that, yes, that's true. Um, you know, the people who give think that they have the right to um, dictate, dictate. But that's not the way God planned it. You know no. what I'm saying? I, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about what you give. If you if you take your your offerings and you go someplace else, um, you know the Lord will make a way. Because if you're an obstacle, then even your money becomes um, gravel in the mouth. Mm -hmm. You know it, it's 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 not worth it. It's not worth no. it because because I mean if if we serve a God who is who has everything right, and He says I'll supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. And what little bit, whatever you got, even if your name is Bill Gates or 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 Jeff Bezos, what difference does it make? You only got this according to the Lord who owns everything in the universe. I mean, he can he can literally have a rock fall to the earth mm -hmm. that can be, you know, um uh the size of a car that's a pure diamond, hmm. worth more than all the money in the world. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, he owns everything. Right. So that's nothing to him. I mean, why why would we why do we overly concern ourselves because somebody is giving uh and they give substantially, but then they want to be the obstacle in the church? Yeah, that's that's a, it's a serious problem because it has been a practice, just as you said, uh, and the person that made that comment, that is true in many churches. Mm -hmm. Uh we look to the person who uh, who has great lineage in the church, tenure, the family's mm -hmm. been there for a long time, their uncle was so-and-so, their aunt was so-and-so, and whoever is the biggest giver, it, they get a lot of, they have a lot of influence in the church. 
But I believe now we're at a point where uh, if we don't want, if we don't, if we're serious about stopping this cycle of drunkenness of any form, this drunkenness of seeing or, or this seeing the hindrance or the lack of growth and development in people and transformationalized people, we have to put a stop to it. Mm -hmm. um, because I think we're just going to continue to evolve as because if you if families are like that, persons individually are like that, uh, going around in circles, the ministry, the church is going to go around circles, never really blossom yeah. Yeah. like it should. And and you know I, I I believe that what you what you hit on with this text uh, in looking at the change that's needed, um, it's almost like in the Old Testament, I think it was, it was Joshua, uh, where Joshua, God is telling him, hey, listen, I've given you the land, but you got to mm -hmm. go in and fight for it. Mm -hmm. Ephesians mm -hmm. is like that type of, jo of, of, of the book of Joshua. Ephesians talks about your position, what you have in Christ, but then later on, it talks about your practice in the world. So, mm -hmm. so, so your, our conduct, and you got to fight for that, too, because, you know, put on the whole arm of God. So uh, in order for us to help people today and to see them come out of whatever those issues are, because we all have issues, we all yep. struggle, yep. you know, yep. um, it requires, like you said, just constantly sitting at the feet of Christ, learning how to enjoy being in Christ, enjoy, mm -hmm. you know, getting in the word and worshiping and being around uh, brothers and sisters is, who are talking about careers, who's talking about finances, somebody wants to learn about stock market. You know, we we have to begin to go into those areas to expand the mind and also cultivate and develop the spirit. Right, right. I'm, I'm so glad you said that because you know, um, you know, it says small people talk about people, great people talk about ideas. Hmm. You know, we we ought to be gearing ourselves up to talking about the idea, the ideals, and the, 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 you know, that is that which is to come. Right. Not talking about people and what they do, their idiosyncrasies and all that kind of stuff. If a person has an art with them, then you ought to approach them. The, the Bible has very clear steps of dealing with people who, right. who are unruly and, and disconnected. You talked about it. Um, you know, eventually um, those persons are sat down when you're doing it biblically right we have not been functioning biblically we have been dysfunctional in our application of god's word when it comes to helping to um if you will eradicate or in the scripture that the, the the amplified bible says you know staying away from those who how is i mean i mean let me look at it i want to say exactly what i what the what the what, the, what, what it said um, so I'll make sure that I'm clear about it. But it said that um, um, living life with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil. Mm -hmm. Shunning those who tolerate and enable evil. See, see, one of the things I think that we've done as a body of believers is that we have become enablers to the enabler. Yep. We right. give them license to do what they do. So the church now is stifled. So when people talk about the folks not coming back to the church and they're not in the church and the church is not growing and so on and so forth, well, the, a part of that is because we've been enabling those individuals who have been, um, you know, we, we, we've tolerated and enabled the evil to take place. We've allowed that to continue to manifest. That's what we got to change. So the same, the same verses, um, not as unwise, but as wise, sensible, and uh, intelligent, and discerning people, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence, because the days are filled with evil. Hmm. It's right there in the scripture. I didn't make that up. That's right there in the scriptures. So the, the Bible tells us, gives us clarity of steps, clarity of purpose, clarity of doing this. And so we need to do that. So having said that, we're almost out of time. Oh. So what I want to do is I want to give you an opportunity to share in any way you want. Uh, we have 10 minutes. So you can take half, I'll take half. 
Um, because I got to close out. The Lord has put something on my heart. But please share with us, you know, whatever you want to say, Doc. Uh, I'm so I'm really so glad that you're here tonight. This is a wonderful conversation. Um, so I'm turning over to you. Oh man, listen, it, it's been an honor to uh be here with you. And I thank you for thinking of me. I think that, you know, um sometimes we 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 you know we we are on the journey and we're doing so much and we forget uh, uh we forget, oh, we know each other, but you know, we forget that we're all connected. And so right. you you were able to connect, reach me, and I, I I don't take it for granted, you know. I was raised to say thank you. And so I take the time to say thank you for even just inviting me to have a conversation with you uh, in, in this in this powerful topic. One of the things I was thinking of, and I'll close with a few of these things, is just thinking about this text again and thinking about being filled with the spirit so that our, so that when okay what paul talks about is uh, singing and making melody uh what, what what speak to one another and, and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs when the spirit of god is indwelling us and filling us and a lot and it, it it changes the behavior just like with alcohol people that are drunk changes the behavior mm -hmm. with the spirit of god coming in changing our nature right mm. uh i re i recall coming up again and go back to Big Mama's house and Big Daddy's house in the South, there was a time where, and I'm sure someone might be able to, I'm sure someone can identify with this, in the kitchen, hmm. when Big Mama's cooking, she's singing. She, she's singing, uh, she's cooking and she's singing uh, and, 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 and everybody's happy. There's a different atmosphere hmm. that's cultivated hmm. there. You feel like going in Big Mama's kitchen. You sit there, you watch her cook, but you also hear the songs. Sometimes they would put on the radio. They would you would hear music. Uh, back then it was quartet singing, but mm. it didn't matter. You would hear uh, music singing that was uplifting uh, and was part of the strengthening of our faith. And I believe that that's what we need now. It may not 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 necessarily that you have to go back to the type of singing as far as quartet mm. singing, but the idea is to realize that. When we are uh, filled with the Spirit of God and we continue to expose ourselves to the Word of God to get this kind of teaching and the Word digest and we understand the Word, our lives are changed, then our conversation changes. Mm. What comes, you know how to say what you put in comes out. Absolutely. Well, well, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> yeah. So, I, and I believe that's what we need today transformed lives. And you, you cannot see transformation thoroughly. Uh, without seeing or being exposed properly to sound teaching. We're missing sound doctrine. We're missing, I think today, all of the things that we've seen in scripture, we used to hear preachers talk about years ago, is happening now. And mm. so we have to really uh, do what we can to, to put a halt to it in order to bring growth, proper growth in the lives of people and, and just have a feel of chance of lives. A lot of people uh, can do more. I'm sure if they were just exposed to, to just like you were exposed to the word of God, you know, all we were exposed to the word of God. One mm -hmm. way or another, we got it. Mm -hmm. But how are people being exposed? Have they been so jaded by what they've seen by conduct and some of the people that are unruly? Has that just turned people off totally? Uh, but we have to make sure that we continue to present Christ in a way that's relevant for where they are so that uh, they will want, they have a hunger and a passion for this Christ who has brought change to our lives. So I hope, I hope that's clear what, you know, what I've shared. And I really am a firm believer, of course, of this word of God, and especially this passage we have put, presented to us today to reflect upon an article. And then my prayer is that we as people of God, we as a nation, we as community, we come back to the faith and continue to take the faith more serious. We have, uh, in closing, I say this, you know, when COVID hit, churches changed, doors closed, the whole nine, right? And I heard a preacher say this, and I, I, I actually literally saw this, and I believe it. A lot of people came to me, Reverend, Pastor, when are we going to go open up the church again? I really missed coming to the church. I sure wish I could get back to church. The doors of the church have been open, right? A lot of those people never came back. Mm. And those that did come back, they come back once a month. You can't find them. You can't see them. Right. So many people did this. They ran back into a building, but they didn't run back to God. 
that's a problem. So it makes you wonder, well, what, 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 what does it take now? What, you know, it's like 9-11, 9-11, everybody's coming to God, everybody's holding hands, no matter what, what denomination you were, what color you were, we just like, hey, we, you know, hey, let, you know, now COVID, the same thing. And, and so now what's gonna happen next? Do we need another COVID? Do we need something else, another pandemic to get us to realize that we need to get closer to God and not worry about the building? The building, thank God for the building, you know. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying that that's again, going back to this issue of being filled in the spirit. So anyway, I'll leave that right there. Thank you again. Well, no, you're welcome, man. Thank you for sharing. That's, that was a good point. That was a really good point. Really good point. Um, I, I, I've been a big firm believer that, um, you know, COVID exposed us really exposed us for who we really are you know paul was right being intoxicated with wine leads to hangovers early morning dry mouth lots of wasted time wasted resources misused talents and squandered money this pericope talks about the spirit the new king james version uses the word dissipation which is another word for depravity immorality corruption debauchery dishonesty wickedness sin when one is filled with the spirit of drunkenness, they are counted among the unwise, doing the very opposite of those who are filled with the spirit. It always fascinates me when I think back to my days of drinking, consuming other mind altering substances, how committed I was to spending time and money to acquire those substances, taking the time to consume the substance, taking time to be under the influence, and of course, making time for the recovery well you don't have to do much because you ain't got much of a choice because if you inebriated when you get you have to recover so you, you don't have much of a choice you're going to go through that part and i i must admit many of those episodes i cannot fully recall even though each one consumed somewhere around eight to twelve hours to go through all of those steps and who knows how much money all in pursuit of what i thought was a good time when we stop following the flesh and begin following the spirit, stop getting intoxicated with wine of the world and choose to be intoxicated in the spirit, we're no longer at the disposal of Satan or his demons. We are in the hands of God. And Jesus fills us with the one he said he would send, the one he called the comforter, the Holy Spirit. If you're going to be intoxicated, let me encourage you to get drunk in the word of God. The experience is amazing and the rewards are eternal. Get intoxicated in the spirit. My guest tonight is the personification of someone who is intoxicated in the spirit. He could have easily stayed in the secular world and made millions of dollars, but he knew once he drank from the cup at the fountain that the Lord presented, the wine of the world would never come close to the wine that the Lord has. He has a different childhood story than mine, except that you know, all that kerosene stuff I get, out there. But, <laughs> <laughs> which does not show, it really just shows us that the Lord, the Lord is able to use anybody who is willing to sit at the table and become intoxicated in the spirit. His life, when compared to mine, shows just how serious Jesus was when he said that he is no respecter of persons. He'll use anybody. Reverend Dr. Logan, you make your parents proud. Living life with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil, not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, and discerning, making the very most of your time on earth recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence. We didn't talk much about the church tonight, but we'll have you back on. We have been trying to sync our schedules for a while and get you to be my guest on Matters of Faith. I thank you for carving out time and blessing us tonight. Your generosity, your wisdom, your passion, your love for people is obvious. It wasn't just words on your bio but who you are every day of your life. Doing what you do comes easy because of who you are. A man who is clearly intoxicated in the spirit. Now, I hope you enjoyed your first visit with Matters of Faith. 
tonight. Absolutely. You know, I have enjoyed your visit immensely. And judging by the comments made by the family and our guests, I'd say they did also. So you are very welcome tonight. And let me know when your schedule permits, because we haven't spoken about the church, this historic church of 133 <laughs> years. Yeah, don't feel bad, guys. But, you know, we were just talking about the holistic church. But we're right. going to talk about we're going to talk about the church, the church that called him to lead them the next time he comes on. And when your schedule permits, let me know so that your first visit won't be your last. Bless you. Is that okay with you? That is fine, brother. Thank you. I appreciate you, Dr. Russell. All right. Then I'll take that as a yes. And now yes, sir. don't forget our sponsors and advertisers. Please don't forget the JLR company, J. Lauren R. Consulting, LLC. Those are my companies. For all your church financial needs, call 718-328-8096 or visit our website, www.jlaurenmuscleconsulting.com. It's not about the castle. If COVID didn't teach us anything else, it taught us it's not about the castle. God don't care about no buildings. It's about the kingdom. God is concerned about the kingdom and the kingdom of heaven is within. Matters of Faith, the book. I've been talking about it tonight, but this is the book. You can get it at my cash app, dollar sign Matters of Faith. And I've been saying that the book is $23 and change. It's not. The, tw the book is $23.92, $24. That's what it costs. Because every time I go to mail out one of these books, post office raises the rate even for books so it's twenty three dollars and ninety two cents or get it as an ebook the ebook is easy www.smashwords.com not amazon you cannot get it on amazon you have to go to smashwords.com backslash books backslash view backslash nine nine three one seven seven it's on the facebook you'll see it it's, it's one of the messages i typed it in there you can see it but get it as an ebook and you'll get it immediately and there are no shipping and no handling costs Better Mag Magazine, www.abettermag.com. Now, this is a Black-owned magazine. Uh, we had Gloria Gant, who is a publisher, um, last week on the show. She's a phenomenal woman, and they're carrying my column now. So let's support them. A two-year subscription is only $27.50 for a two-year subscription. They publish every quarter. And please don't forget to subscribe, like, and share our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. Telephone, text, email, message, any way you do it, but tell a friend to join us regularly on Monday nights for Matters of Faith, the radio show. We're always live on Matters of Faith and the J. Lauren Russell's Facebook groups. And when the show is over, we drop each episode on our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. You can watch that while you're laying in your bed because you got it on your television. And that's why I ask you each week to subscribe, like, and share our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. Now, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. If no one has told you this today, then I wanna be the first to say that I love you and there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. So get used to it. God bless you, I love you, and good night. <laughs>